from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Walmart roped into a crypto hoax. A release claims the massive retailer will start accepting the cryptocurrency Litecoin as a form of payment. Only problem, the release was fake. The founder of Litecoin will join us exclusively to tell us his side of the story. Plus, epic appeals on the back of a massive verdict in its case against Apple. So, what's round two for the game maker versus the iPhone maker? We'll chart the long legal road ahead. This on the eve of Apple unveiling its next generation of iPhones, watches, and maybe even some new AirPods and iPads. Who else but our own Mark Gurman will raise the curtain on Apple's virtual event on Tuesday. We're going to get to all of that in a moment, but first, let's get a look at the markets this Monday. Lots to talk about with our Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta. Kriti, take it away. Well, Emily, a little bit of a choppy session. You didn't really see tech lead the index higher, although this was the first uh, positive session for the S&P 500 in six down days, so pretty significant. Of course, tech not really getting in on that, and you, of course, saw Chinese stocks as well. No, once again, not getting in on that. I really want to broaden this out, though, and show you what drawdowns look like, because one of the big concerns here is that we are in the month of September. So September is really known for seasonality, known for its pullbacks, and yet we haven't seen one for a really long time, no more than about 3%. And still, even after last week's sell-off, you only saw a less than 2% decline. Question is, can you start to maintain that upward momentum that we saw today? I do, of course, want to end with some of that risk sentiment really showing up in cryptocurrencies because intraday, you really saw the Bloomberg Galaxy crypto index down on the day. The exception with all the cryptocurrencies being lower was, of course, Litecoin and that just a touch higher, Emily. All right, Kriti, thanks so much for that roundup. I do want to get more on that hoax that sent a shudder through crypto markets. It all started early Monday when a press statement was released saying that Walmart was about to start letting its customers use the cryptocurrency Litecoin as a form of payment. Bloomberg has previously reported that the retailer advertised a job opening to develop a blockchain strategy. But it soon became apparent that the release was a hoax with both Walmart and Litecoin denying the tie-up, but not before Litecoin retweeted and subsequently deleted the fake release itself. In its place, Litecoin wrote, the Litecoin Foundation has not entered a partnership with Walmart. Joining us now exclusively, Litecoin founder and Litecoin Foundation Managing Director, Charlie Lee. Charlie, thank you so much for joining us. Look, what happened here in your perspective? Um, well, what happened was this morning I woke up and found out that Walmart is accepting Litecoin. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. And that turned out to be a fake. Um, so we didn't have a partnership. The thing is with Litecoin, the decentralized cryptocurrency, anyone can really start supporting it and accepting it without um, talking to me or without going through the Litecoin Foundation. So what happened was this news got um, released by Global Newswire and Reuters. And one of our social media guys saw it and thought actually thought it was true because, um, because it was re uh, reported by Reuters. And he retweeted it, and then 15 minutes later, he immediately saw that it was a fake news, so he deleted that tweet. Now, are there any efforts to make whoever is behind this accountable? Like, if this was a pump-and-dump effort, can you track who, who, who's behind this or, or somehow track uh, the trader who was involved? I guess it's possible. I'm sure Global Newswire... Um, has in con is in contact with the person who submitted this news report, so they can try to figure out who, who did it. Um, in terms of um, us as Litecoin Foundation, there's not much we can do. I mean, people can release fake news um, for cryptocurrencies all the time. Actually, this happens with traditional stock market also. So it's not just in cryptocurrency. Uh, Global Newswire did just come out with a statement saying they're enhancing authentication steps after the fake release. They will work with authorities on a full probe. They say the incident was, quote, isolated, never happened before. You know, uh, Litecoin itself, you know, as you said, said the release was fake, said the quotes were fabricated, said someone on the social media team got a little too eager when they retweeted this. Um, but Litecoin did pop big time uh, on this quote unquote news now that we know uh, it's fake news to those who might suspect someone on your end 
is responsible, what would you say? I mean, it, it's definitely not anyone on our end. Um, Litecoin being a decentralized cryptocurrency, um, pretty much it's anyone can, if they want to, um, if they want the price to pump, they can potentially release these fake news. Um, so I'm going to deny it that it has anything to do with us and we'll try our best to figure out who did it and we will stop fake news from, from uh, spreading. What internal compliance changes are you making as a result of today's events? Well, we realize how powerful our um, our Twitter handle is, handle is, right? So we want to make sure that we don't uh, retweet fake news. We want to double check and make sure it goes through some uh, checks before we actually tweet anything. So that's something we definitely have to improve on. Litecoin is still very volatile generally. How much is it actually used in payments today? What are you doing to incur encourage future use in payments? And I wonder, is this is at all a setback? Well, it's Litecoin is used quite a bit for payments. I mean, it's not as popular as Bitcoin uh, per se, but it's used quite a bit. There's um, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of merchants. It's hard to know exactly how many merchants support Litecoin. Um, but we do know from on-chain transactions that about $3 billion um, worth of Litecoin is sent every day. So of course, not all of that is for payments. Some of it is people just moving the Litecoins around or through exchanges. Um, but a lot of that is actually people paying for stuff using the Litecoin network because the transactions are fast and it's cheap and it just works. Uh, Litecoin has been around for almost 10 years now. Actually, next month is our 10 year anniversary. So over that span of 10 years, there's over a trillion dollars worth of Litecoin sent over the network. So it shows that Litecoin is actually being used and it's, it's pretty popular. This isn't the first scam tied to crypto, certainly. You've also pointed out this isn't unique to crypto, but when it comes to equities, there are consequences. There are, there's regulation. There are certain controls in place. How should the crypto industry handle these kinds of situations? What kind of regulation do you think the SEC should bring to bear? Well, I think the crypt decentralized crypto is a little bit different from, from stock, right? So. The Litecoin Foundation is a nonprofit um, that's supporting Litecoin, but we don't, we didn't like print Litecoin. We don't have, we didn't create Litecoins for ourselves. So unlike a company, for example, like Tesla, which has shareholders and um, the CEO has a lot of Tesla stock, if Elon Musk tweets something that pumps the stock, which he has done previously, it's really bad for for the whole um, for the industry. Whereas for Litecoin Foundation. I mean, we try our best to not tweet fake news, and this time we really screwed up, and we will try harder to not do that. Um, but because it's a decentralized cryptocurrency, we don't really benefit from pumping Litecoin. So there's no incentives for us to do that, and that's the way it works. I, I'm not sure what kind of more regulation it needs to be, but I definitely think having more a stricter um, fact-checking policy for, for journalism is, is important in this, in this case. You liquidated much of your holdings in 2017 after criticism that your public opinions could affect the price. Is that still the case that you have zero or negligible holdings in Litecoin itself to this day? That's correct. I have um, maybe 20 or so Litecoins, maybe less, depending on what I use on a daily, on a daily basis. Um, and that's that's actually a good point because this means that I have no incentive to, to do something like this. And... Um, it's really bad for, for this to happen, and we really need to look into it. Now, you have a partnership with BitPay, and you have been working on getting wider adoption out there, getting more retailers to accept cryptocurrency as a form of payment. What do you think the next level is here when, you know, to, to be fair, there, there, is, there are scams. There is distrust. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty around cryptocurrency that remains in general and the skepticism could be a roadblock. Yeah, so our partnership with BitPay, we've announced recently, they have over a thousand merchants supporting um, crypto and now they can easily accept Litecoin. So merchants like Newegg and Cheaper have started accepting Litecoin. And other than that, we also have a partnership with Terminal. We launched a Litecoin card, which is a Visa card, where if you spend Litecoin, or if you spend, um, money at a merchant accepting visa, you basically, uh, your Litecoin will be exchanged on the spot for a dollar. And we're also working on launching that internationally. 
And lastly, PayPal launched Litecoin support last year. They have 375 million users and 29 million merchants. They also announced that they plan to let their merchants accept uh, crypto and Litecoin later. So expect to see a lot more merchants accepting Litecoin in the future and a lot more people being able to easily buy Litecoin and spend it wherever they want. So what are your priorities for the Litecoin Foundation for the rest of the year, especially uh, given what has just happened? Well, it's obvious that we now need to get Litecoin accepted at Walmart. That's just That just became our number one priority. But all, all joking aside, so last week we announced we got a new feature called OmniLight to Litecoin, which lets user trade tokens and create tokens on top of Litecoin. This is the same technology that um, Tether uses on Bitcoin to support USDT. So we're talking to Tether to also potentially launch USDT on Litecoin. And OmniLight will also support NFTs soon. And lastly, one of the biggest upgrades to Litecoin is actually coming later this year. It's called MWeb, which adds um, fungibility to Litecoin. We're hoping that uh, this uh, upgrade will be accepted by the network and the users, and we'll see it live uh, later next year, or I mean, earlier next year. All right, uh, Charlie Lee, Litecoin Foundation Managing Director, thank you so much. I should add that Bloomberg and many news organizations, as Charlie pointed out, fell victim to that fake release. We retracted the headlines as soon as we realized they were fake um, and, and once we realized what has happened. Okay, in other headline news, Epic Games is appealing last Friday's ruling by a California judge in its antitrust lawsuit against Apple. While the district court judge said Apple must allow all app and game developers to steer consumers to external payment methods, she fell short of calling the iPhone maker a monopolist. Epic sued Apple after it's removed the Fortnite game from its app store because the gaming company created a workaround to avoid paying that 30% fee on in-app purchases by customers. Epic wanted to stop what it called, quote, illegal restraints on competition. We're going to talk about what comes next post-appeal later this hour. And sticking with Apple, we have more from the iPhone maker this week. Tuesday, the company will unveil a host of new devices, including four new iPhones at an all-virtual event. Later, Mark will also join us to talk about what's on deck. And Tuesday also marks the deadline for ballots in the California governor recall vote. We're going to check in on that. Then Wednesday, SpaceX will launch Inspiration4, the all-civilian crew heading for a three-day orbit around the Earth. Of course, we're going to have full coverage right here on Bloomberg Television. Coming up, the race to check out is heating up as the buy now, pay later trend continues to attract big business. I will be speaking with Post House Capital CEO Jackie Reeses about what comes next and why credit cards could become a thing of the past. That is next. This is Bloomberg. The race to the checkout is on as fintech companies look for more ways to provide alternative forms of payment methods. With e-commerce seeing unprecedented growth amid the global pandemic, companies are looking to give shoppers a bit more flexibility when it comes to making purchases, including expanding their crypto offerings and enhancing digital wallets. Joining me now for more is Jackie Reeses, Post House Capital CEO, who of course also led Square Capital, the banking and lending product at Square. Additionally, she serves as chairwoman of the Economic Advisory Council of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and is a board member of a firm, Context Logic, and a few other companies. Jackie, great to have you back with good us. To see you. Look, good to see you too. Buy now, pay later is the trend everyone wants to talk about. How do you see the industry adopting this and evolving as a result? Yeah, so I would think about it as an invention of a form of money. And you use it in your daily life. You have a lot of options for how you want to pay for something. And buy now, pay later is very effective because it gives you flexibility for how to manage your cash flow. So think about it creatively, right? Instead of thinking about how much money each item costs, you think about what you can afford on a monthly basis. And so it gives you tons of flexibility to avoid big chunky payments that don't match with your uh, income. And so it also helps people who have unfairly low FICO scores because it's a form of credit, even though it's such a short duration payment style. And then interestingly on the business side, merchants love it. It drives traffic to retailers. Retailers see a significant conversion in e-commerce on their platforms 
and much higher average order values. So it's a win for everybody. Is it really a good idea for customers to be racking up more debt, though? Could this hurt them down the line? Well, it's not necessarily more debt. It's a different style of payment. And so it doesn't necessarily mean a consumer is spending more. It just gives them flexibility for how they spend. And I think every consumer really needs to pay attention to income and expenses. And if they have better tools to do that, it just makes it easier to manage. You say that this is going to lead to a battle at the checkout, if you will. If so, who wins that battle? What companies? Yep. So I absolutely think there's going to be a battle at the checkout coming. And you might not really have thought about it as you're checking out of an e-commerce company and you click your form of payment. But if you really pay attention, we now have multiple ways to pay with multiple companies in each option. So you have credit cards, you have digital payments like Google Pay, Apple Pay, Shop Pay. You have Buy Now, Pay Later players. You have peer-to-peer -peer buttons like Cash App and Venmo. And so each are trying to streamline the experience at a checkout to make it as easy as absolutely possible. And so I think that's what you're going to see in the future. And those that are starting to amass large consumer experiences are going to be able to streamline the button at the checkout. And so you'll start to see an evolution of that as these big consumer payment systems evolve over time. Well, and you have big tech companies that also want to own that experience. Apple was dealt a pretty big blow by the judge in the Apple Epic ruling, though they won on many of the counts. When it comes to payments, a judge found issue with their payment system. Do you see that having a ripple effect down the line? What does that mean for Apple? Yeah. I think there's a bifurcation of the impact, one related to games and experiences that actually happen in the app, where moving out of the app becomes a terrible experience for the consumer. And I think in that case, consumers will continue to stay within the app. But outside that ecosystem, I think it highlights the importance of being in the middle of the payment flow. And if you're able to link to an external source for payments for lots of different app types, that's an incredible opportunity for app developers to move their checkout experience beyond the app. And I think being in the payment system is absolutely the critical piece for app developers having that data on who their consumers are and being able to engage with their customers on any platform with any payment type they'd like to take. And so I do think it's a great win and an important one because the wallet really matters. I know you're following the crypto market, Jack Dorsey and Square making a big bet on Bitcoin. At the same time, you've got this Litecoin hoax that we just talked about earlier in the show. The head of the Swedish central bank has warned that Bitcoin could collapse dramatically. There still seems to be so much risk and uncertainty associated with the crypto market. How do you balance out all these risks as an individual investor or as a company trying to decide whether to get in or whether to accept cryptocurrency as a form of payment? Yeah, I think we're just at the early stages of looking at Bitcoin and crypto. And so I, I see issues like what happened with Litecoin as something that will be uh, happen in ordinary course, particularly until the regulatory environment is evolved and developed for cryptocurrency. And that still has yet to happen. I think what I'm most excited about for the long term is what Bitcoin can do as an open source payment system for the Internet. That totally blows my mind and excites me so much. And so if you think back to a little bit of history, and I'll go to 1781 when the Bank of North America got started, it served as a central function to organize independent governing authorities. Those authorities were states. And the Bank of North America evolved them into a central organized function so that we could have a payment system that created a tender type and created a store value that could be managed. And so what Bitcoin does is it moves this idea to the digital world and updates it such that money can evolve from 1781's vision to a digital version of today. And so as I think about what that means, I think it's a better way to deal with the current ACH system, better way to deal with the current credit card system that we're using today. And in reality, it removes the emotion it removes sovereign politics out of the system and turns it okay. into a rules-based system that transcends any one country. So I think that's incredibly powerful 
and I'm excited about what it what it holds. That was quite a history lesson. Jackie Recess, great to have you back on the show. Would love to have you back to talk about more things that blow your mind um, when we get another chance. Post House Capital CEO Jackie Recess there. Thank you. Coming up, not so fast. Scientists say the COVID-19 pandemic is far from over. And the warning, more breakthrough cases, school cancellations to come. We'll discuss next. This is Bloomberg. We're now heading into the second fall season following the COVID-19 pandemic with many questions still lingering about how long this will last and what comes next. Joining us to discuss what the future of the pandemic looks like is Jody Schneider, our Bloomberg News political editor. And Jody, you know, the warnings only seem to be getting more dire. What yep. does lie ahead? Yeah, it's not good news, Emily. I'm sorry to say, but we had thought that we would be in a very different place now, especially in places like the U.S., where we had those vaccines relatively early. It seemed like the miracle. But now we're finding that we really, in that race between the vaccines and the variants, the variants are winning. And until we get 90 to 95 percent of the global population either vaccinated, immunized, or having immunity from having had the virus, uh, and surviving it, obviously, we're not going to be at a place where we're, the virus is, uh, you know, gone away, as we'd like to think about it, and returning to some sort of normalcy and, uh, and you know, going back to how things were in 2019. So I think there's what going to be a number of things that are going to disappoint people in coming months. Quickly, what does it mean for kids in schools and their parents and their workplaces that employ parents with kids who might be dealing with school cancellations. Yeah, and that's what's hard, right? Um, you know, everyone had been looking at this trajectory of going back to work, uh, kids going back to school, and now we may be seeing situations, particularly as variant, different variants arise, where you're going to be back and forth some, and where outbreaks arise, and governments are going to have to decide what to do when you get that right. kind of outbreak. It's, you know, the uncertainty is terrifying, um, obviously, in addition to the disease itself. Bloomberg's Jody Schneider, thank you so much for that update. Coming up, an NFT company focused on redefining the digital royalty space is now backed by billionaire Steve Cohen, the co-founders of Recur. Join us next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. China's top tech regulator warned internet firms against blocking links to rival services. This just another sign of Beijing's tough crackdown on the country's tech giants. Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta has been following China tech stocks and more. Kriti, take it away. Well, an over 50% decline for those U.S. listed Chinese stocks. When you're looking at their peak all the way back in February, all the way to their recent trough, and then you saw a little bit of a bounce back in Chinese tech stocks. Then today, yet another wave of regulatory scrutiny, this time targeting Ant Group and their Alipay, in addition to more gaming stocks. So I really want to show you what this did intraday because, of course, you did see tech broadly underperform, but the real kind of... Uh, decliner here was that Golden Dragon Index. Once again, those U.S. listed tech stocks down 1%. This even as they saw some pretty heavy volume. I want to show you that even the Nasdaq Biotech Index, some of those U.S. video games, which is that sole active index on the bottom, did poorly as well. The sole tech-related outperformer today, semiconductors. But let's focus in back on those gaming stocks. I told you what Chinese gaming stocks are doing. They've been just in a complete decline. Let's compare that to U.S. gaming stocks, because if you look at that, that's going to be that orange line. Compare that to the S&P 500, you are seeing a major divergence year to date, really underperforming what the broader benchmark is doing. Compare that to last year, Emily, in 2020, when a lot of these video game makers were excelling with that pandemic bid this year. Completely different story. All right, Kriti, thanks so much for sharing that context there. Appreciate it. Well, the popularity of NFTs has exploded over the last year, with the last month's daily sales seeing an all-time high, according to nonfungible.com. The NFT company Recur is now valued at $330 million, thanks to new funding in part uh, contributed by billionaire Steve Cohen's family office. Recur is aiming to set a new digital standard for NFTs. For more on how, I want to bring in Zach Brush and Trevor George, co-founders and 
co-CEOs at Recur. Uh, Zach and Trevor, thank you so much for joining us. So I just interviewed the founder of OpenSea. They're getting a lot of traction. How is Recur different and how does it plan to stand out? Trevor, let's start with you. So we build white label uh, experiences for large global IP, whereas OpenSea is a marketplace with all sorts of different IP. We create separate marketplaces dedicated to each large global IP for the fan to really dig into the whole world of, of what that IP might look like. For example, we announced NFTU today, which is our official collegiate NFT experience, all colleges and only college IP uh, and NFTs. Steve Cohen isn't just any billionaire, Zach. What does he bring to the table? What has he told you about what he's excited about here? Steve Cohen's one of the greatest investors, traders, and art collectors of the past century. So he really understands NFTs and the metaverse at a really special level. When you think about NFTs, what is it, right? It's this culmination of, of trading and, and underlying liquidity of sorts, collecting, gamification, culture, community all those different types of things, and his background really lends itself to that. The entire team that he's formed around him at Digital, Mark Daniel, Benjamin Milstein, have been absolutely incredible. They've been super thoughtful about how they've approached the space. They've been in the space for a while, um, just haven't been outward about it, and we're really excited to be partnering with them. There's certainly a lot of excitement around NFTs, but a lot of skepticism as well. I wonder what he and you think about, uh, you know, some of the skepticism that NFTs could be just a get-rich-quick scam. Trevor, why don't you take I that remember, one? <laughs> well, I remember when they were saying that yeah, about well, I think the idea crypto trading year, year, years ago. So it's funny to see the same thing happen here. Sorry <laughs> about that, Trevor. Why don't you go ahead? No, I was just going to say the idea of digital ownership is, is here to stay. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, people collect digital cards or, or physical cards, Pokemon cards, Yeezys. You know, for many, the digital world seems intangible. They can't touch it. They can't see it. You can't see people grouped in a stadium. But... For equally as many, there's hundreds of millions of people in the digital world that, you know, love and come around uh, and socialize about things that they can collect and prove ownership over. And it's becoming a status symbol, owning uh, uh, an, an, an NFT in a community digitally. Now, I've spoken to folks who think NFTs aren't just the future, but the future of culture, which is a pretty big proclamation. Uh, Zach, what do, you, what do you think about that? Where does this go if it goes as far as you hope it will? Well, I think NFTs are really the next frontier of community. And if you look back historically on community and the internet and the role it's played in the late 90s, we're on internet, internet bulletin boards, then to AOL chat rooms, to Reddit, to now Discord. And NFTs are going to be this next frontier where fans of large brands, large global IP, um, sports teams, fans of musicians will be able to co connect directly with that musician, with that artist, and communicate with them, and rally around specific ideas, rally around uh, other like-minded people and individuals. So community always drives everything, and community will drive everything in the NFT ecosystem. What about taking it a step beyond to the metaverse, uh, Trevor? Are you uh, e uh, equally optimistic about the metaverse, and, and what if a company like Facebook owns it? Yeah. yeah I I think the metaverse is a really hot topic right now, and there's been a lot of articles. You know, the metaverse isn't any one thing. It's not one place you go to. It's the idea of being in a digital world and interacting digitally. So I think the future of the metaverse is a connected web of different metaverses or, or, or digital worlds. And for us in the NFT space, metaverse presents a new commerce opportunity, right? Because right now we have brick and mortar and e-commerce. In the future, we have Metaverse. It's an entirely new channel, especially for the IP that we're working with, to create something and sell it in a digital place. And there may be many digital places. So how do you think about, then, in the future, the relationship between the physical and the digital? Like, Zach, what's going to be more valuable in the future, an NFT or an actual painting? Well, I think in the future, they'll, they'll link together. I think we're going to start seeing a, a tie-in between the metaverse and the traditional, you know, real world. The world is becoming more and more digital. We're spending more of our time online. Even right now, we're on a Zoom interview. That wouldn't have happened years ago. I work out on a Peloton, and I have a whole gym class online. So we're, trying, we're starting to bridge the gap between this metaverse and this online and digital world and, and, and the physical world. 
So I think as the years go on and as technology progresses, these experiences are going to become way more immersive and, and engaging. And as more capital comes into the metaverse ecosystem, all sorts of new things will be built. So I actually think the two worlds will collide and you'll see enhanced uh, art in the physical world because of its tying into the metaverse and vice versa. So it's a very exciting time. Well, the increasing digitization of everything obviously opens a lot of opportunity. It opens more op opportunity for accountability, but also potentially for scams. I mean, earlier in the show, we were speaking with the founder of Litecoin on the back of this Walmart Litecoin hoax that sent, you know, Litecoin shares skyrocketing, and it was totally untrue. I mean, how do you deal with that? How do investors, folks who are considering the NFT space, deal with that kind of risk and skepticism? Zach? Well, with anything, with anything, you have to do your own research and make sure you understand, you know, what you're buying, what you're trading. And to that, I'd say buy what you love, right? Find an asset that you love and that will be with you because in the, in, the, in the metaverse, that, la that asset will live on. At Recur, we're building best-in-class technology. We have tremendous experience in the crypto side. Our entire team um, you know, have built a lot of their original infrastructure from some of the largest exchanges and trading desks in the crypto ecosystem. And on the licensing side, our team has been involved in brands and licensing for decades. So just like the crypto industry where trust is paramount, uh, when you have to, you have to know, can, you know, can you trust something? Uh, it's the same on the licensing in the licensing world. So at the end of the day, you want to make sure that, you know, you're working with, with the right people and you're doing your own research. All right. Thanks so much, Zach Brush, Trevor George. We'll keep our eye on you guys, co-founders and co-CEOs of Recur. For more now on how tech companies are responding to Texas's controversial anti-abortion law, Salesforce is offering to relocate employees from the state if they wish. CEO Mark Benioff said in a tweet to employees that if you want to move, we'll help you exit. Salesforce isn't alone in addressing the issue with dating platforms Bumble and Match, both saying they will create relief funds for employees affected by the new abortion law. Uber and Lyft have also responded by saying they will cover all legal fees for drivers who could be sued for giving someone a ride to an abortion clinic. And taking a look at the markets, Oracle is falling after hours after quarterly sales fell short of estimates. Shares hit an all-time high in August as investors cheered progress in the company's efforts to gain more ground from cloud rivals. Still, according to Bloomberg Intelligence, some customers continue to hold off from shifting their Oracle databases to the cloud. Coming up, home sweet home. With more people getting used to working from home, are people now investing more in their homes? They certainly are. We're going to speak to the CEO of Angie in our work shifting segment next. This is Bloomberg. another lawsuit over its driver's working rights, this time in the Netherlands. A Dutch court ruled that workers who drive passengers using the Uber app are covered by collective labor law. In some cases, that'll allow drivers to claim overdue salary. Uber says it will appeal. Well, as the pandemic left many people stuck at home on lockdown, homeowners got more comfortable using digital apps to get what they needed, including home services. Joining us now, Angie CEO Oshin Hanrahan as part of our work shifting segment. So Oshin, talk to us about the trends you saw through the pandemic when it came to home services, how people used your apps to do what? I think if you rewind a few years, we had so many questions about this next generation of potential homeowners. The first was if they were going to buy homes at all. You know, you rewind two years ago to before the pandemic, and we were in the middle of this debate around whether whether millennials would ever buy homes. I think that's 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 evaporated and we've seen, you know, millennials join the housing market at a, at a faster rate than ever before. The second is, were they going to buy them in the same locations as we anticipated? So that, were they going to buy them in urban centers? And I think we've seen as uh, as more and more workplaces have opted for more flexibility, we've seen the location where people have bought homes or are buying homes start to change. And then the third is, what do those homes look like? How are they going to lay them out? What, 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 what are they going to do in terms of home office? How are they going to create that space? And you put all that together, 
and people are investing more in their homes than ever before. And they're doing it in a, in a kind of a, a new way where they're considering the macro environment. They're considering what happens if there's another pandemic. They're considering what happens in terms of climate change. And they're being more thoughtful about that investment in their home as they make these big decisions. And it's, it's, been, a really, uh, it's been a really interesting time to watch people change how they think about their homes. So what are trends are you seeing in those investments? What are they spending the most money on? What do they care about the most? So they're buying larger homes. The homes they're buying are further from their offices than before. And they're, they're, they're actually in need of more work than before. So the housing market's so tight that we're seeing people buy homes that need more work, where they're immediately investing and having to, having to invest not just in cosmetic and you know, artificial stuff around the home, but they're actually investing in the infrastructure of the home to get it up to spec. And that takes time. So the, the changes that we're seeing right now in terms of people buying homes, that's going to have a pretty significant impact for the future years on the home renovation spend as people get the permits to invest in those homes, change their layout. And it all comes back to you know, people making this decision to get into the housing market, buy homes that are larger, further from their office. And that's you know, in a very, very tight housing market. That's, that's putting pressure on price, both the price of the home and the price of the services themselves. There's still a lot of uncertainty ahead, though, as to how the pandemic plays out. And yes, employers are giving employees a lot more flexibility than ever. But buying a home is such a big and you know, potentially permanent decision. Is there any uh, hesitancy out there that you know, what happens if in three years employers start to roll some of these policies back and say, we need you in the office? Look, I, I think there's a few things going on. One is there seems to be flexibility right now. And two, people are seeing a very tight labor market. So there's obviously a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, you know, perception where folks think that this is something that's here to stay. We're seeing more and more flexibility in certain parts of the market, particularly in engineering roles and product roles and analytics roles, where people are making decisions to, uh, to invest in a more flexible lifestyle. And, and you know, it, it's not as if these homes are way, way, way beyond commuting distance, but they're just a further away than what you would think of as a normal five-day, uh, five-day-a-week commute. I think people are comfortable making that decision. They think they can unwind it in the future, but it is, uh, it is an interesting time to think about how people really are changing their relationship with their home, changing their relationship with work, and really making a decision to settle down. Are you seeing any interesting trends when it comes to millennials versus geriatric millennials or east versus west versus Midwest. I, I think the biggest, uh, the biggest thing we're seeing in terms of change of behavior is the same thing we've seen apply to ride sharing and ordering food and ordering product. It's this expectation that people are going to be able to buy services at the touch of a button. And we've rolled out Angie Services, which is a pre-priced product, and that business is, has really exploded. We, we did about $73 million uh, in revenue in Q2 in that business, up 100 plus percent year on year. And that's, that's a very different way of buying than the traditional connect with a pro model. And that business is really, really speaks to the change in consumer behavior, where people expect to be able to touch a button and get something done inside their home the same way they can in so many other categories. All right. Uh, fascinating trends you're seeing. Thanks for breaking that all down for us. Angie, CEO, Oshin Hanrahan, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, coming up, we're going to find out what we can expect when Apple unveils its new product lineup Tuesday. All the insights from who else but our own Mark Gurman coming up next. Meantime, Disney's Shang-Chi and the legend of the Ten Rings held on to the top spot at the U.S. box office for a second straight week. It is the first Marvel film featuring an Asian actor in a starring role. The movie took in $35.8 million this weekend in U.S. and Canadian theaters. A sign of optimism for the movie industry that's been battered by COVID-19. This is Bloomberg. Make sure you move into a position where you can be measured for better or worse. 
Uh, so last year was better for us, this year, of course. You take your performance with you, you know, it's, uh, no one's gonna take that away from me and ARC. Uh, and by the way, I'm not worried about this year's performance, just saying, we have a five-year time horizon. Mark Investments, Kathy Wood there. Her company is allowing one of its funds to invest in Canadian Bitcoin ETFs as the money manager seeks fresh ways to bet on digital assets. She was speaking there at the SALT conference. Well, restaurant payments app Toast is seeking to raise as much as $717 million in a U.S. IPO. The amount was disclosed in a regulatory filing. It would value the company at about $16.5 billion dollars. The offering comes as the restaurant industry rebounds from a pandemic that was, of course, disastrous for in-person dining, but a boon for takeout and delivery services. Meantime, Apple set to unveil a new iPhone, an Apple Watch, and more at Tuesday's virtual Apple event. This after the long-awaited court ruling from its legal battle with Epic Games. To dig in, I want to bring in Mark Gurman, who, of course, covers Apple for Bloomberg. Mark, let's start with what's on tap for tomorrow and one, many iPhones, what are we expecting? Yeah, we're expecting three main product categories to get updated. One is the iPhone. You'll see the iPhone 13 tomorrow, along with its mini, pro, pro max variations. You'll see the Apple Watch Series 7 in two new sizes. And you'll see the third generation base level AirPods. And these are going to be minor updates for the iPhone but pretty significant updates for the Apple Watch models as well as the AirPods. And I know a lot of people have been looking forward to uh, tomorrow, and I'd love to dive in on specific details about the, the new devices. Absolutely. Let's hear it. Let's start with the iPhone because there's always a question of just how different will it be? Is it worth that upgrade? Is it going to catalyze that super cycle or not? Where does this one fit in? So I would say 95% of people won't be able to tell the difference with the human eye between the iPhone 12 and the iPhone 13. They're going to have the exact same sizes. There'll be some similar colors. It'll still have the stainless steel or metal bands around the edges determined by if you get the entry level model or the pro models. The big visual change will be a larger camera area for new higher quality lenses, as well as a smaller notch in the display. So you have a little bit more screen area there. And I think some people will appreciate that. Uh, the other thing you're getting is now video portrait mode. It's going to be called cinematic mode. So you take a video, the object in the foreground will be sharp, the background will be blurred, you'll have a faster processor, and there's also some new satellite data uh, transfer features to connect to emergency services or text emergency contacts. The satellite hardware might be in the devices themselves, but I don't think the actual software support of the features will be ready until sometime next year. Obviously, we are on the back end of this Apple Epic ruling over the weekend. Epic appealed. Uh, the game maker lost on almost every count. But when it came to Apple's payment system and in-app payments, that's where the judge found an issue. Um, what does the appeal mean? Are we, I assume we're not expecting to hear anything from Apple tomorrow uh, about this landmark case. Um, but, you know, what are you expecting when it comes to that? Yeah, so Tim Sweeney, the CEO and co-founder of Epic Games, just a little while ago, tweeted they have sent a payment of $6 million to Apple. That's when they implemented the hot, the hot fix. They circumvented Apple's in-app purchase system. They're now paying Apple that $6 million reimbursement for those 30% commissions. It's still too early to tell what exactly the Epic appeal will be, which aspects uh, of the court ruling will they go after. But of course, they've said they are going to the Ninth Circuit, which is a level above uh, the court in Oakland, California, that this trial took place in. And they're going to try to get this turned around. They want side loading. They want third party app stores. They want the commission gone. And they want Apple to be determined to be a monopoly. They didn't get any of that. What they did get is this new steering provision, which is going to push Apple to allow developers to point users to the web to complete transactions. Potentially, that could reduce Apple's cut of their commissions over term, over the long term. You saw Apple do something similar for reader apps, which is like Netflix, Spotify, Hulu, happening next year globally. Given the appeal, how long will this next round of Apple versus Epic be? I mean, is this months or a couple of years? Could this drag on for a decade? 
I don't think it's going to drag on for a decade. I think you're going to see Apple begin to instate some changes to the App Store sometime early next year alongside that reader rule change. Apple has the ability to file a stay. What that means is they can delay that permanent injunction. The permanent injunction is supposed to go into place December 9th, so 90 days from last Friday when the ruling was made. I'd expect Apple uh, to implement a stay there. You're going to see Epic sort of have their uh, time in court for the appeal situation probably sometime in spring 2022. So I don't think this is going to be decade long. I think this is something that's going to get resolved sometime next year, depending on how far it goes. Of course, Epic could take this all the way to the Supreme Court. Personally, I don't hope that hap I hope that doesn't happen, and I don't anticipate it happening. I hope this gets resolved for the benefit of app developers, Epic included, while still keeping you know Apple's rules intact somehow. Right, of course, and there are ongoing cases around the world. There's you know, further scrutiny coming from Washington and U.S. lawmakers. Lots to continue to follow, as you will. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, thank you as always. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Make sure you join us tomorrow. We're going to give you all the details from the Apple event and break it down with Julie Osk of Forrester Research and much, much more. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.